Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. It's possible that a person might hear God's holiness and repent before Him, but feel like somehow they're a second-class citizen. Today, as we look to Joel chapter 2, we find out just how quick God is to bless and restore those who repent and come to Him. Now, as we continue working through the Minor Prophets, it probably feels like we're skipping rocks just kind of going across them so quickly. Yet, we've got to go quickly because we're closing in on the New Testament. I can't wait to get there with you. And so, we're only going to spend one chapter in Joel, and yet this one chapter gives us just a great overview of this entire book. And so, the book of Joel, especially this chapter, contains several verses that will be familiar to the students of the Bible. This chapter gives us the hope that when we repent, the Lord will make up for the years that the locusts have eaten. It also tells us of the day when God will pour out His Spirit upon mankind. Also in this chapter, we find His promise that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't quite put it that way, but it's pretty close. And so there's a lot of gems in this passage. But before we get to them, let's just start with a quick overview of the book of Joel. Now, we don't really know much of who Joel was, or really even his station in life, or when he wrote this book. Back when I was in seminary, I had to memorize the theme of the book of Joel as the Day of the Lord. And that term, Day of the Lord, occurs in chapters 1, verse 15, 2, 1, 2, 11, 2, 21, and 3, 14. In fact, of all the places in the Old Testament, this is the highest concentration of Day of the Lord references in, in a single set of three chapters. And so we're going to come back to the Day of the Lord in a few minutes here, and we're going to be unpacking what more what that means. Now, we don't know when this book was written, but because of its location in the Minor Prophets, uh, just it being the second book after Hosea, we can surmise it was written early on. And yet, even if we don't know the exact time of when this book was written, we can read its verses, we can read its teachings, and we can just kind of piece together what was going on. And so as we work through this book, we're going to see that the prophet is warning the people of divine judgment that's about to come. Now, the day of judgment is compared to a plague of locusts that will come upon them unless they repent. And then the prophet looks even further into the future and sees a time of final judgment that will be poured out upon all of the unbelieving nations. And so, for a quick overview of Joel, chapter 1 is a literal description of a locust plague. Chapter 2 pictures an army marching in on them, upon them, like a plague of locusts. And chapter 3 is just a prophetic look at what will happen to all of the unbelieving people, unbelieving nations, on that day of the Lord. And so, with that as just a quick overview, let's go to verse 1 here. And and verses 1 to 5 describe what this invading army looks like. And so, Joel 2 verse 1 says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, and and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. And so, although we didn't read it, we we know that chapter 1 is just recounting this locust plague. And Joel puts the people on notice that a far worse plague is coming with the day of the Lord. And so, the locust plague from chapter 1 just prefigures a far worse invasion by an army that's going to sweep down upon them in a swift, all-consuming character and manner like that of just a swarm of locusts. And all of this is just part of that day of the Lord here. And so, here we're seeing in verse 1 that the day of the Lord is just a day of reckoning when God's judgment falls upon a people, but we're also going to see in a minute that there's a far more devastating day of the Lord that is still yet to come. Look how verse 2 describes this near event of the day of the Lord here. Verse 2 tells us it's going to be a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, and a great and mighty people will descend upon them. In verse 3, fire proceeds from them, consuming everything before them, leaving desolation behind them. There is no escape from them on this day. In verse 4, as this enemy descends upon them, their appearance will be like that of horses or war horses which have been arrayed in armor. In verse 5, they will the sound of chariots, and they'll be able to leap from the tops of the mountains, one top to the other top. In verses 7 and 8, they'll have a well-organized army that marches with discipline and order. And in verse 9, they will easily defeat their enemies. Now, who is this army? Well, commentators aren't really sure. Um, some say it was an army that got their doorstep just to the north. Some say it's the armies that will descend upon Israel that we read about in Ezekiel 38 and 39. We're not entirely sure. It could be both. Either way, verse 11 says that this army has been sent by God to do his work. Now, does this mean that this army was literally trained and equipped by the Lord and maybe just sitting with him like around the table, planning with him? Okay, let's come in from this side. You go over there. Is that what God is saying here? No, no. This army here is is doing the Lord's work. And the Lord will use even the enemy armies to accomplish his purposes. 
Passages like 2 Kings 24.2 or Habakkuk 1.6 tell of how the, the armies of the Babylonians were ultimately accomplishing God's work and bringing God's judgment. And not only that, we also know from over in verse 20 that this army is not really on friendly terms with the Lord. And once the nation of Israel repents, the Lord's just going to drive this army out. If the people repent, the Lord's going to drive them on out. And so this is just an army from among the nations that the Lord will use as a means of judgment and refinement for his people. Well, going back to this passage here in verses 12 to 14, as this invasion looms, Joel calls the people to repent before the Lord. Verse 12 says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, with weeping and mourning. Verse 13, rend your heart and not your garments. And so the Lord's looking for true, real, heartfelt repentance here. Not an outward show, but true, real repentance. And look why Joel calls the people to repent in verse 13. He says, because the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, relenting of evil. And in verse 14, if the people were to repent, perhaps they would even find God's blessings. He would pour blessings upon them rather than his judgment. And so this day of the Lord is coming. And if they want to get right with God, we see the appropriate responses of true repentance in verses 15 to 17. They are to blow a trumpet and gather one together. They are to consecrate a fast for everyone. And this gathered fast is to include everyone from their society, from the elders to the children to the infants. In fact, in verse 16, this fasting of repentance is so important that even if someone just got married, even if it's just like a guy and a gal just got married, they should give up their honeymoon and, and just gather with this assembly as well. And as they gather in this national fast of repentance, in verse 17, the priest, who is the Lord's servant, says just to lead the way in just weeping and calling out to the Lord, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a, a reproach and a byword among the nations. And so Joel is calling the people to repent. And, and he's saying the Lord is coming. His judgment will come in the form of this invading army that no one can stand up against. And if they just want to avoid this judgment on that day, they must repent. And this repentance is so important. They are just a call of fast for the entire nation. And everyone is to seek God together in repentance. Now, what will happen if they do that? Well, look at the blessings that come from this national repentance. In verse 18, the Lord will be zealous for his land and have pity on his people. In verse 19, he will hear their prayer and answer them with blessings of provision. In verse 20, he will remove this army from, from among them and drive them out of the land. And so if the people were to repent, God will withhold the judgment he was about to pour upon them. Not only that, uh, verses 21 to 27 speak of the blessings that God will give them. In verse 21, the Lord tells them not to fear because he has done great things. They should know this. They should trust him. In verses 22 to 24, they will have a plentiful harvest once again. Their vats will overflow. And verse 25 says, I will make up to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. In verse 26, you will have plenty to be satisfied and praise the Lord your God. And then in verse 27, they will know God himself and they will know that there is no other God beside him. And so all of this is to say that Joel has given these people a warning of this coming army. He calls people to repent and promises that if they do, God will restore them. And so all of this is straightforward. But by now, as we've been going through prophecies for the last couple of months, by now we're probably accustomed to a lot of times there's prophecy like that foothills. Remember, there's that low foothill and the larger mountain behind it. You see one event, but it's really speaking of another event later on. And so as we go on in this passage, in verse 28, Joel's gaze now lifts higher from that near judgment of this looming army to an event at the end of times, the final day of the Lord. And so verse 28 tells us that on this final day of the Lord, the Lord will pour out his spirit upon all mankind, now, not every single person, but anyone from the nations, any nation, any person from the nations can repent and come to the Lord. And these people, they'll prophesy and dream dreams and see visions from old men to children to the servants. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, then you probably know that this was partially fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And that's just when the Holy Spirit came upon the early church and they, and they just went out from there and just, and just proclaimed the message of the Lord just to the world around them. But that was just a partial fulfillment. It will be finally fulfilled at the end of time. Right now, God's Spirit is available to every believer and strengthening us and enabling us to keep our covenant with Him. And yet, in a far more beautiful manner, there is coming a time when we will all have his spirit in a way that will make us like those of the prophets who hear God's voice and just have that amazing communication from him. 
And so all this is happening at the end of time. And in these days, the Lord will do great things, it says in the skies. They'll appear as blood and fire and calms of smoke. The sun will go dark or seem to go dark. The moon will turn red or to blood. And these will be signs to all of the earth to call upon the Lord. When you see these things, call upon the Lord. And verse 32 says, whoever calls upon him will be saved. Now, if we were to go on to chapter 3, we'd see that this final judgment, this final day of the Lord continues, and the nations will be gathered before the Lord in verse 3 of chapter 3. In verse 10, there'll be a time of global peace in the world. In verse 12, the nations will be judged, and this will be a terrible time for those who are judged. But in verse 16, the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold for Israel. And the book of Joel ends with this promise saying that his people will dwell in the land and he will judge their enemies. And so that's the book of Joel through the lens of chapter 2. Now, what do we do for application with this passage here? Well, for one thing, all around us, the world needs to hear Joel's warnings. There is coming a day of the Lord where where the Lord will call the nations to this valley of decision, of judgment that chapter 3 talks about. And while there is still time, we must repent. And just as time would eventually wear out for Israel, time will eventually wear out for the rest of this world as well. And we need to continually, as God's servants, hold forth God's message to the world that he is holy and that he will judge people for their sins and therefore they need to repent. Now, another thing about repentance, back in verse 13 of chapter 2, the Lord tells the people to rend your heart and not your garments. Now, back then, a person would show their grief by tearing their clothes. Now, this was all well and good if it was sincere, but often it was easier to act remorseful rather than be truly repentant. Repentance means change. It means living differently. And God called them and he calls all of us to not simply just feel bad for our sins, but to turn from them and walk in his ways of righteousness and holiness. Notice also that repentance precedes God's blessings in this book. If we refuse to turn from sin, God cannot bless us because he'll be blessing a path of disobedience. He's he's too holy for that. And so he calls us to leave the path of judgment and walk in his blessings that we might receive the good things he has in store for us. Finally, when we repent, the Lord will restore to us the years that the locusts have eaten. He will pour rich blessings in our lives. He will make up for the loss. Now, ultimately, these promises will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. But in my own life, in my own experiences, I have found that God often brings restoration and grace and blessings and provisions right back into our lives when we repent and just walk in his ways. God is a good God. He's a righteous God. We can repent and come to him and find out how wonderful he is and just how worthy he is of our lives and our total and full dedication to him. Well, that's Joel chapter 2, another wonderful chapter from the wonderful word of God that we have. Thanks for listening to this podcast. I hope to catch you with you tomorrow. Until then, have a great day and God bless.